am stepping out in faith. Uh, I'm, I have an idea of where this is, could go, but that's like 50 ideas of where this could go. So the fir- this is my third time um, speaking at Manifest. And the first time that I spoke, preached, I guess I preached, I don't know. Did I preach? Should I turn this down a little bit like that? There we go. Um, I wrote it out word for word, the whole thing. I had to have it word for word because I was so afraid that I would get up here and forget what to say and not you know, speak eloquently or spiritually or intelligently. So it was word for word, and I just read it. And I tried to look up to make eye contact, but it was, you know, it's not quite the same as just speaking freely. The second time, I tried to do a mishmash. I tried to have just some bullet points of here's some things that I'll talk about that I feel confident enough that I know about, but I still had probably at least half, maybe 60% of it written out again word for word. This time... I don't have anything written out word for word. So I have bullet points. I have some slides. Oh, I got to hit this, and then a blue screen will come up. Not a blue screen of death, hopefully. Um, And um, so I know what God wants me to share with you today because it's something that he's totally been speaking to me, totally has put on my heart in the last year, but I don't have the exact words written out. So I hope I fill the 30 minutes, 35 minutes, what's the magic number? So I have pages of bullet points, but I'm just going to speak from the heart, share with you what God's been uh, revealing to me, and hopefully I won't be up here for two hours, but it's rude to leave anyway, so you can't go anywhere. (laughs) Um, um, So when um, about, uh, I don't know if it was like seven or eight years ago, my brother-in-law, Shauna's brother, and I wanted to learn how to play hockey, and we had never skated before, well, maybe a little bit as kids, but we did not know how to skate. Um, We never played hockey growing up. Um, my house wasn't a hockey family, so we thought we're, we're grown men living in Canada. We should know how to play hockey. This seems like an appropriate thing to do. So we took this like uh, beginner's adult um, hockey course where they taught you all the basics of hockey and taught you how to skate. And I remember the first uh, session, we got all our gear. First of all, we went out shopping, bought all the gear, put it all on at home because it felt cool to look like, ah! Um, I'll leave out the bit where I didn't know. Where does this piece go? And where does that go? Um, so we got there, and, and uh, they're like, okay, we're going to start with some skating basics, like some C cuts and, you know, using the edges of your skate, stuff I didn't know anything about. And we would all skate from one end of the rink to the other um, and then get to the end, and then we would turn around. And, and this, is a, this is what it sounded like for me doing this activity. It would be, okay, everyone go, bang! <laughs> that was me hitting the boards at the other end. We'd all turn around and then do it again, and all these great stops, and then bang, me hitting the boards. Because I did not know how to stop in hockey at all. So I would just let the front of my skates just hit the boards and hold my hands up, and the gear is really good. It like totally protects you. Um, I decided though that I was gonna learn how to stop. So I got a, um, it was Cardell at the time, it's Vivo now, a 10 pass card to go skating 10 times during public skates and just try and learn how to stop. And it was me going around the outside of the rink like probably going two or three feet and then trying to stop. Two or three feet and then trying to stop. Um, Incidentally, if you are trying to stop in hockey, you don't just turn sideways and dig your skate in. That just makes you spin around in a circle. Um, You have to like slide your skate along the top. Hockey players know this, skaters know this. There's like two little edges and they have to scrape along. Anyway, I probably spent seven or eight um, two-hour sessions at Cardell just doing that around the boards, trying to learn how to stop, and I learned how to stop. And I'm so, it was like one of my biggest accomplishments. I know how to stop on skates. This is amazing. I I not only learned how to stop, um, but I also now have this cool connection, this cool memory of going through that repetitive exercise um, to be able to accomplish this thing. And so it's like this twofold um, accomplishment. I can stop, but I also know that I can learn how to do it. And if I stick to it, I can do it. So that's a lead into what I want to share with you today that God has been doing in my life over the last year with prayer. And so this is my sermon title. It's the power of persistent prayer. Positive products are promptly perceived and people practice perpetual parlaying in proximity to our perfect parental protector. Thank you, Microsoft Thesaurus, for that one. Um, uh, if, you, if you've been to church at all, uh, you've probably heard a sermon about prayer. Uh, it's a pretty common Christian topic. It's, it's, a, it's something that we're expected to do in our Christian lives. It's something that enriches our Christian lives. Um, but it's not necessarily something all of us know 
how to do or are comfortable doing. That being said, if you're not new to uh, churches, if you're not new to Christianity, sorry, I'm going to get a drink. That pause was for effect. Um, then uh, maybe prayer is totally new to you. Brad does this great thing when he is uh, introducing a new uh, piece of scripture, a new Christian concept, he'll explain it like Christianity 101 for people that maybe aren't familiar with it. Um, and I, I really like that. I've been a Christian for 25 years, but I find most of the time the things that he says that are meant to be basic, you should understand this, is new to me or it's a good reminder for me or it reinforces that knowledge that uh, I thought I knew but maybe didn't have a good grasp on it. So I'm going to take us through um, prayer. I'm spitting out my juice as I'm drinking. Um, I'm going to take us through like prayer 101. So um, the icon, I know it looks like clapping, um, but it's the only icon that PowerPoint had, so pretend it's praying. Um, <laughs> that's like the Holy Spirit coming out of the hands there. Um, so I think it's really a really good refresher for all of us to just go back to basics in prayer. And if, you, if you're not familiar with prayer, let's, let's break it down into what it is. So I'm, I'm doing the real simple who, what, when, where aspects of prayer. So um, what is, uh, who? Who do we pray to? Uh, we're praying to God. God is um, Jesus, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. There's a whole thing about the Trinity there that I am not going to touch this morning because not qualified. Um, no, I'm qualified. Sorry, Brad said last week that we're not supposed to say I'm not qualified. I'm qualified, just not going to do it this morning. Anyway, <laughs> we're praying, we're praying to God. Um, what are we doing? We're talking to Him. We're just, we're talking to God. That's what prayer is, the, the most simple way to explain it. Uh, when do we pray? The Scripture gives us lots of examples of when to do it, but the short answer is always, all the time. In Ephesians, it says, uh, pray in the Spirit on all occasions. In Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, it says, pray continually. There's never just a moment for prayer or a start and a stop to prayer, even though that's probably the way most of us do it. The Scriptures tell us to pray continually, all the time. And where should we pray? Everywhere, anywhere. I think a lot of people think, oh, we should just do it in church or should we just do it at home. But prayer, God wants to hear from us at all times in all places. So that is prayer 101. Um, is, that, is everyone good with prayer 101? Any confusion or question about prayer 101? No, is everyone on board with that? All right, perfect. Then we can move on to a more advanced class, prayer 501. Um, and maybe these are two questions that you've been thinking about in relation to prayer, which is why, why pray, and perhaps the more complicated one for some of us, how. How do I do it? Um, I think some, one of the things that keeps a lot of us from praying, particularly praying out loud or praying in public, um, or even praying with our kids or our family is, I don't really know how to do it. So we're going to explore that really quickly. Um, I'm going to start with the why, and we're going to take a look at a passage where Jesus is praying, and he's by himself. Uh, he's praying um, just before he's in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is before he gets taken by the bad guys to be crucified. My, my knowledge is not as good as Brad, so like you can check this stuff later. At any rate, his disciples are off uh, having fallen asleep, and... Um, Jesus goes off to pray. So I thought, let's take a look at a passage where Jesus is praying, and let's examine why he's doing it. And I really like this uh, passage, which is um, verses 6 to 9. I'm going to read it out and then just point out a couple of interesting things here. It's way too small on my screen, so I'm going to look here. Um, no, I have a Bible. No, I left it on my chair. Um, <laughs> Jesus is praying. He says, I have revealed uh, you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. He's, he's uh, praying about his disciples. He's talking about his disciples. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Look, take another quick look at this scripture and um, ask yourself where Jesus is asking for something. He's not asking for anything here. Where is Jesus um, describing a problem that he's having? It's not anywhere in here. Um, not that those aren't things that we should pray about, but I love that in this passage, Jesus is just talking to God. He's sharing with God what's going on in his life at that moment, what's going on in his ministry. This is stuff that God the Father already knows. Jesus is God, and he knows, so obviously God the Father must know, but he's just 
talking to God. He's pouring out what's on his heart with his Father. There's no, uh, there's no request. There's no um, complaint. Yeah, he's just, he's just having that conversation. I think that is a really um, cool indicator of why we pray or why God wants us to pray. He just wants to hear from us. He might already, he, he knows. He knows what's going on in your life. He just wants to hear from you. And so, um, yeah, I, li I like that Jesus is doing that. He then goes on later on and says, um, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. I really just like this verse a lot. That's mainly why it's in here, because I think it's a really cool verse. I think a lot when I pray about um, protect me from this, or save me from this, or pull me out of that, um, kind of these negative connotations of prayer. We think about only prayer when we need something, or when we um, are are, are in trouble, or we, um, yeah, we have, we have a need, right? We, we often ask in our life, who needs prayer? Well, we, we all need prayer all the time, but the, the context of that question is, um, is there something bad going on in your life that would warrant us needing to pray right now? And that, that's not what prayer is meant to be. It's meant to, to encompass every aspect of your life. And so Jesus here is, um, he is praying for his disciples, but he's actually not even asking that their life on, on earth, and he's praying for us too, that our life on earth is, would go easy and then all the bad stuff is, would go away. He's just saying, protect them from the evil one, but they're going to stay in the world. Um, and then uh, he goes on to pray beyond just his disciples. He says, I, my prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me um, through, their, through their message. The scope of his prayer is he prays, his, the scope of his prayer is getting bigger and bigger. He starts with just what's going on in his life, and then it expands to his disciples. Now it's expanded to all of us, and, and even those who ha haven't heard his message yet. Um, I think this is a cool why we pray. This is um, just talking to God and then expanding the focus of what's going on in our lives, what's going to go on in our lives with our Heavenly Father. And finally, um, he says, I want those... You have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Here's a request, finally. What is it, 22 verses later? No, that's bad math. 18 verses <laughs> later um, is when Jesus finally says, um, God, here's what I want. It's only at the very end of all that prayer that he says, I want, and then um, declares to his father what, what he wants. And it's a good want, but um, yeah, I think so much when we think about why I pray, it's because I have a need, I have a want, so I'm going to start there. But God just wants to have the conversation. Um, so how? How do we pray? We have a really great verse in uh, Luke where his disciples come to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus teaches them to pray, which is fantastic. How often have you had a question uh, about the Bible and opened it and it just answered it perfectly? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What does the Bible say about this? And usually you've got to like go around. I like this one because it's, how do I pray? Here, here's how you pray. How many people have heard of this prayer, the Lord's Prayer? Super common prayer. Even if you're not uh, probably familiar with church or Christianity, you've heard um, of or about the Lord's Prayer. And this is Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. I'm not going to stay on this one too long, but it's... Um, Father, hallowed be your name. I like that fa Father is, again, it's the relationship piece immediately identifying the relationship between us and God. Hallowed be your name, which is worship. Uh, your kingdom come, Lord, let what is going on in heaven happen here on earth through us. Give us each day our daily bread. There's a request. There's one, and I think that's the line we probably, again, focus on the most when we're thinking about prayer is, or at least I do, I should speak from my experience, asking for things. Uh, forgive us our sins, that's, that's a confession and wanting to turn from our, our ways. And also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. That's, again, expanding that circle to uh, the rest of our lives. Um, God just wants to hear from you. He, he wants to know what's going on in your life. He just wants you to speak to him. He wants you to tell him stuff he already knows. Lord, here's what happened today. Lord, here's what I'm going through. Lord, here's what this person said, or here's this thing I'm excited about, or here's this thing I'm, I'm struggling with. He just, he wants that relationship. He, God wants to get involved in every aspect 
of your life, not just your needs, not just when you're hurting, not just when you're going through a hard time, although absolutely he wants to be at the very heart of that. He wants to be involved at all times. I don't think that that is a revelation, but maybe a reminder um, that that's what prayer facilitates. Um, so God is not just a consultant with a to-do list um, that we would talk to whenever things aren't going well. He wants to have that relationship. Um, so um, the next part I want to talk about, so that's prayer. We got prayer, and I'm, I think I'm doing okay for time. So the next part is uh, persistence. I finally got it right. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about persistence, and I'm going to uh, keep talking about it until you get it. That's okay. You can laugh at these jokes. They're funny jokes, so if you're not sure. They are funny jokes. Um, this is really good. So we just saw in Luke 11 where his disciples have asked Jesus, uh, Lord, teach us to pray, and uh, Jesus has taught them the Lord's Prayer, and immediately after that verse, he then gives them a parable. So this is uh, still in Luke 11. The Lord's Prayer ended at verse 4, and then at verse 5, he immediately starts with this parable, this parable um, which is a, uh, like an analogy, a way that Jesus describes um, it gives us a, a, like a day-to-day -day situation that we can understand in order to understand the way that God works or the way that faith works, or in this case, the way that prayer works. So he teaches them this par parable. Uh, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. Now, anyone who has kids, like, yeah, you're, you're seriously ringing my doorbell after my kids are asleep, really? Like, that's what I think is going on here. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Jesus has just taught his disciples how to pray, and then he gives them this parable about persistence and boldness and shameless audacity in terms of um, what, yeah, how you should pray, what drives you in your prayers. Um, this one kind of leaves a bit of a bad taste in my mouth, though, because of the whole assumption here that if we're the one knocking at the door and we think of God as the man in bed who we're, you know, coming to and saying, here's what I need, um, this doesn't feel so much as like God the Father giving us what we need because He loves us and we need it. He's giving us what we need because we just won't shut up. <laughs> and so I kind of, I really struggle with this one, and I've struggled with this one before. Maybe you have too. Um, so I did some digger deeping to find out what's really going on in this passage, and I found uh, two different teachings on it. And I'll share the first one, which which I think I agree with, but doesn't really work with my message. So then I'm going to talk about a different one that works better for what I'm talking about. Um, so one teaching I found suggested that uh, this parable isn't about the man at the door. This is about the man in bed, that we are the man in bed. And that as Christians, it's our responsibility um, that whoever comes to us, whenever they come to us, even if it's inconvenient, even if we don't have what they need, uh, it's our responsibility to answer the door, to help them, to try and meet their needs. Um, so that, I think, is, yeah, that's a great teaching. But let's go to the other teaching, because uh, it works better, like I said, um, is that even if you don't get an answer, keep asking, keep praying. Um, this says to, uh, the, the, uh, because of your shameless audacity, that we're to approach God with shameless audacity, with boldness, with confidence. We're to pray and ask for things, um, not, you know, meekly and timidly coming before God and going, oh, Jesus, if, you, if it's all right and you don't mind and if it's in your will, then could you maybe perhaps consider possibly? He wants us to come before him and say, Lord, this is what I need. This is what I'm asking for. And to keep asking boldly and with confidence, repeatedly, regardless of uh, when you get an answer or what answer you get, he wants that bold, persistent prayer. That's a demonstration of our faith, which God loves to see that we're continually saying to him, I know you're going to provide for me through this, so I'm going to keep coming to you with it. Um, in uh, Luke 18, Jesus gives 
another similar parable. These are like the two persistent parables in, uh, in the New Testament. I should say Luke and John are both um, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for those who aren't familiar. They're in the, at the beginning of the New Testament. If you are, haven't started reading the Bible or you're wondering where to start, start with one of those four Gospels, I would say. That's the story of Jesus' ministry. Um, and yeah, that is a really good place to start. So in, in, uh, later on in Luke, in chapter 18, Jesus gives a similar parable. Uh, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Again, when should I pray? Always. How should I pray? Never give up. That's a family motto in the Ginn household. Never give up. So that's, if you're, even if you take nothing else away from this other than that, always pray and never give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. And for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. A um, little bit of self-serving <laughs> there at the end. Um, but again, this is, this is a parable that Jesus taught. This is in the living word of God, and it says, keep at it. You will, the, 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 the parables here are these people getting what they need, not because they were righteous, not because they necessarily deserved it. Um, the, the focus of the parable is because of their persistence, they were heard, and their, uh, their request was granted. Um, so God wants us to be persistent in prayer. That, I think, is unquestionable. Um, so we know uh, kind of how to pray. We understand that persistence in prayer is something that God is asking us to do and, and wants us to do. Um, so what's the power that comes from that? Um, I'm going to talk about the power of prayer, and I want to first share a little bit about what my experience with the power of prayer has been. I've been a Christian for about 25 years, and it's only in the last one year, I would say, that I've been experiencing a very different kind of power of prayer than what I thought power was. So when I thought of the power of prayer, I thought of one word and only one word only. That's it. <clears throat> How many people can resonate with that? Is, it, is there anyone else? A few hands. For me, that was it. For, for me, um, the biggest or most important or most demonstrative um, reflection of, of the power of prayer was being a, was uh, for someone to be healed, being able to heal someone through prayer, be healed through prayer, see someone get healed through prayer, um, which is... For me to have thought that that was the core power of prayer is a little ironic because I never saw it. Um, I s have struggled with this my whole life. For those of you who know my wife, Shauna, uh, <clears throat> not Brad's wife, Shauna, you know that she has struggled with health issues her whole life. And we've been in and out of the hospital more times than I can count. I can show you where the best vending machines are and which best cafeteria food there is in all three hospitals. Um, she has struggled with all kinds of stuff. I won't go into all the details, but we've been, yeah, we've been through it. And I have spent agonizing hours, days, weeks, years praying for her to be healed, praying in situations for her to be released from the pain that she was in during those moments, praying that this cycle of whatever was going on would stop and she would be able to do these things that, um, that she wasn't able to do because of the pain or the, or the illness. And um, I never experienced those miraculous, powerful moments that I associated with prayer where I put my hand on her, I prayed, Lord, take this migraine away, or Lord, take this pain away, or Lord, heal her from this. And yeah, it just it didn't, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Um, so I really, really struggled with that. That was... Um, that was a source of frustration with God for me. Um, I would say to God, you know, your word says to pray. Your word says ask and it will be given to you. Your word says um, if you have faith, you will, you will um, be able to move mountains, let alone heal, you know, a migraine or a kidney stone. 
And so I started to, this frustration um, started to turn into, you know, maybe I'm not saying it right, or maybe I'm not um, expressing my faith right, and I would, I would play with semantics of prayer, and I would, I would try to do everything I could think of to um, make this healing power happen for my wife. And, and it never did. I can remember getting together with Brad. Oh, boy, I can't even remember how long ago this was. But, and, and sharing this frustration. Brad, I wish I could t- tell everyone that I remember some revelatory thing you told me. But I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't remember. Other than he listened. And I just, yeah, I just poured out my heart of this, this frustration I was having with not seeing this power of prayer that I thought was, you know, the real power of prayer is being able to heal. Um, there's, a, there's a different power. When I asked if anyone that, that resonated with anyone else, there actually weren't that many hands going up, so maybe the rest of you have got this better than I do, but this is only something I've been learning in the last year, that the, the real power of prayer is in that relationship that gets built with God. That's the real power. It's a lasting power. It's not an instantaneous thing that happens. Um, you know, Brad spoke a couple of weeks ago about Jesus being fully man. <coughs> Excuse me. That he experienced life exactly the way that we experience it um, so that we can, uh, he can identify with us. And when we hear about the, the difficulties that he went through, we can know that he suffered them the way that we would suffer them. He was still perfect. He was sinless. But he was fully human. And I remember thinking, well, but that's not totally true because he turned water into wine and he raised people from the dead and he walked on water. So I went back to those in scripture and I discovered that he turned water into wine through prayer. He asked for the Father to bless the wine and through Jesus' faith and confidence, the water was changed. He raised people from the dead through prayer by asking God the Father to Um, to raise that person from the dead and through Jesus' faith and confidence that person was raised from from the dead. And even when he walked on the water, that was because of his connection with God, his relationship with the Father, um, that he was able to do these miraculous things. And we know that that's not just limited to Jesus. When Jesus was walking on the water, Peter said, I want to walk on the water too. And while Peter had that faith and that confidence and that relationship with Jesus, that relationship with God, Peter was able to take three steps in the water. He didn't start to sink until his faith started to shake, uh, until he started to doubt. So we know that that power, that same miraculous divine power, is available to us through prayer. But it's about the building of that relationship with God, that connection with God through prayer. That uh, is the real power of persistent prayer, is creating connections with God in every aspect of our lives so that every aspect of our life reflects Him and, and reminds us of Him. Our connection to God is increased as we create connections between Him and the things in our lives. That's what persistent prayer does. That's what persistent prayer has been doing in my life. Um, So the power of persistent prayer. Um, I pray with my son Tommy and my daughter Cleo um, every night, and we have been doing this persistent prayer thing for the last year, praying for the exact same things every night. The list is getting longer because we keep adding stuff to it, and the list is changing because the things that we've been praying for have been coming true which becomes its own really cool prayer journal, by the way. Prayer journaling is a really good idea. I don't do it. Probably most of you don't either. Um, (laughs) But if you are persistently praying for the same things every day, that becomes your prayer journal because as you pray for those things, you're going to think about what has changed in that area. So when I lost my job, I think I've spoken a little bit about this, I, um, I started praying for a new job, and I prayed every day for a new job, and that it would be a certain type of job, I'm not going to go into all of the details, um, but that happened every night, and then I got a job, and I, so Tommy and I, we kept praying for my job, prayed that I would be uh, open with my faith at work, prayed that I would be efficient, that I would bring value, and, and now 
we still pray every night for my job, but whatever's going on in my job, that becomes the thing we pray for that day. And when something is happening at work during the day, I'm reminded of my prayer, and I start to realize, oh, yeah, I prayed that I would be efficient today. So I, like, I become efficient, and um, that connection now exists solidly between every aspect of my work and my God. And that's, what, that's a power of persistent prayer. Um, Tommy and I have also been praying for, and Eric, forgive me, <laughs> we've been praying for the Calgary Flames to win the Stanley Cup. Now, saying it out loud is a little, is a little, we're a little worried. Now, this started when the previous coach of the Calgary Flames got fired, and Tommy said, we need to pray for him. We need to pray for the coach of the Calgary Flames that he can get a new job. So we did, and he did. Uh, and now we're praying for Bill Peters, the current coach, and we pray every night that the Calgary Flames would win the Stanley Cup. And yeah, amen. And now, every time we see a hockey game, every time the camera shows Bill Peters, what do you think Tommy and I think of? What do you, what do you, who do you think suddenly becomes involved with us in that moment? God becomes involved with us in that moment because we've connected the Calgary Flames with God by praying every night. That, to me, is a power of persistent prayer. God's involved in that now. And win or lose, though they're gonna win, win or lose, <laughs> That connection remains, and it's so awesome. It, it is a super, super, super cool thing. We prayed for someone to rent Stephen and Carlin's condo, and they did, and we're still praying for that to see what changes in that. We were praying for uh, healing for some friends, and they were healed. I didn't get to see it with my eyes, so I'm still kind of struggling with that one, but she was healed, and now we give thanks, and so now that is permanently connected with our relationship with God. Um, we've started praying for Alex Trebek, and I'll encourage you to pray for Alex Trebek. Um, I don't know if you saw, but he was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer, and Tommy saw the, the video and said, we need to pray for Alex Trebek. And also Mike Babcock, for some reason, I don't know why. He's another coach in the, Cal in the um, NHL. Um, Cleo prays oh, so persistently. She has this one mighty prayer, and I'm really excited to see how this manifests. Dear Jesus, thank you for my Mickey Mouse and my Minnie Mouse. I don't know what's going to come of that, but she has created a solid connection now. She has basically said, I love Mickey Mouse. I love Minnie Mouse. God, can you please come and be involved in my joy of that thing? Let's make God part of that. Make Jesus part of that. That for us uh, has been the power of persistent prayer. Um, I have a few minutes left. Oh, I'm doing so good for time. I'm really excited. Um, <laughs> It's working. It's like when you step out in faith, God actually responds. Imagine that. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm not trying to emulate Brad. I'm trying to do my own thing, but he is really artistic and creative, and he puts in these cool images and graphics in his PowerPoints. I tried to do that. Um, <laughs> so... Just imagine that's what it looks like. Whatever it needs to look like for you to go, yes, I'm totally going to do that from now on. Imagine that that's what it is and imagine it's animated. <laughs> that would be, that's what's up there, right? If you need to see it in your mind, that's what's up there. Um, I, God, God wants a relationship with us. He, he wants to be involved in every aspect of our lives, and he wants your prayer life to be that. He wants your prayer life to create those connections between every aspect of your life, just the things that are going on, the things you're excited about, the things you're frustrated about, the things you need help with, the things that the people in your life are experiencing and going through, the things... Um, for the people who aren't in your life yet, you know, again, that idea of expanding that circle. God wants to be involved in every aspect of your life. And when you pray every day for those things, the same things, that connection gets created. It gets stronger. You're, you will start to hear God's voice and see his work in your life because you've created that connection. You're now looking for God to work in that aspect of your life. You're now looking to see how things change. That, for me, has been the experience of persistent prayer. Jesus has taught us that we're to be persistent and bold and confident, that we're to pray to God and create that connection. And so that 
is what I'm going to encourage you to do today. There are these little white sheets, and Brad has talked about them every day, and there's pens at the table of a, a takeaway to write down, and it's always been, um, you know, if you think of something, write it down. Can everyone grab one? Grab one. Like if someone needs to grab some and hand them out, or pens and hand them out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you do this. Write down something that you're going to pray about. It can be anything. It can be, I love board games. It can be school. It can be something you need. It can be something you have. It can be a person. Like, it doesn't have, it, it can be that need-based prayer that here's the struggle I'm going through, help me prayer. Yes, absolutely do that. But don't be confined to that. Just think of something you want to connect God to. It can be the most mundane, simple thing. But when you create that connection, when you pray about it every single day, you will see God's hand in that part of your life. And that is a power that I'm going to pray every day for all of you to experience. So write that down, and I'm going to pray right now. 